Lopoli, and thank you for your time this morning and look forward to your questions. Deepa. Thanks, Ben. Hello, everyone. Um, greetings from near and far. Thank you so much for joining us. We have uh, gotten a lot of great response uh, as attendees for the audience today. Um, I'm uh, Deepa Olapoli, the Associate Director of the Seeger Center and also a uh, Research Professor of International Affairs at GW. And um, we have all gotten a bit used to this sort of format, the webinars and so forth, as Ben mentioned. Uh, I'm sure you all have too. But I just want to say that uh, should we have any technical glitches, I'm hoping that uh, my staff will jump in and save us. Um, in any case, uh, before I introduce the uh, outstanding set of speakers that we have for you today, uh, I just want to remind you that next Tuesday, the UN General Assembly is meeting for its annual uh, General Assembly meetings, of course, virtually, just like us. So New Yorkers won't uh, uh, get the, the get that huge rush of uh, of people and uh, uh, high level attendees and celebrities and so forth. But the they're reaching a big milestone this year, and that is it's the 75th anniversary of the uh, United Nations. So it's a major milestone. And one of its announced aims has been to, quote, to generate renewed support for multilateralism, unquote. Now, we know that uh, this renewed uh, support is quite necessary because of what's been happening in the last several months. We have seen that the UN system has been coming under a lot of strain, questions and controversies that have been swirling around it, uh, partly in, uh, due to the pandemic that we're experiencing. Uh, questions about excessive control of the agenda by certain countries, uh, in this case, China. A uh, question of finances. So, you know, this has raised a lot of questions, a lot of eyebrows at the kind of questions that is being uh, raised. And all this is happening just as the urgency, I think, for international cooperation is more than ever given the pandemic that we're uh, facing right now. Uh, 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 but in that context, another announced aim of the um, 75th uh, uh, General Assembly is to increase inclusion in the multilateral system. Well, that brings us directly to the topic of today uh, that we're going to be looking at. And here, of course, is that um, the idea of uh, Taiwan. And the, today's topic is multilaterals and Taiwan's role how is cooperation on security, health, and travel evolving amidst a um, pandemic? And so, um, you know, one of the uh, topics that we're going to be looking at is Taiwan's con uh, continuing exclusion from this, even as, uh, um, uh, as the stated aims is something else. So in the spirit of inclusion, um, we have gathered a very impressive set of panelists to help us uh, think through these uh, topics. And uh, they come from three important worlds. One uh, from the academic, another person from the policy world, and a third from journalism. And it's my pleasure to introduce uh, these uh, three individuals to you. And I must say, they'll be speaking. Uh, we have two panelists that we'll kick off with. Uh, we'll kick off with uh, Vincent Vang, who is joining us from New York, where everybody else should be at this point in a normal time. And uh, Vincent is uh, a well-known expert on Taiwan, all things Taiwan, I should say. Uh, I've turned to him many times and to his work. He is currently the Dean of the College of Arts and Sciences at Adelphi University. And um, he has just joined it last year. You just got there just in time for the pandemic, <laughs> yeah, Vincent. He's a prolific author, um, serves on a number of editorial boards, such as uh, Asia Policy, uh, Issues and Studies in International Quali uh, Quarterly on China, Taiwan, and East Asian Affairs. He has a long uh, and distinguished uh, 
uh, resume that I won't go through, but he's been dean in other places. And I just have to say, um, I want to thank him especially because school just opened last week, and I know that he is probably overwhelmed with the major decisions at his university. And he's, by the way, the only person sitting in his office. He was apparently allowed in today. Um, in any case, so I just want to say, but you know what they say, when you want something done, ask the busy person and, and it gets done. All right. Um, following Vincent, who will be speaking about the pandemic and international prospects for Taiwan, um, especially not just in the uh, WHO uh, system, but also in the uh, in the arena of travel, because travel and health, as we see, are now become interlinked uh, in more ways than we thought. Uh, once uh, Vincent uh, is done, I'll turn to Jessica Graham, who is currently the president of JG Global Advisory. Jessica comes from the policy world, as she has over a decade of experience in uh, uh, international security issues, law enforcement, non-traditional security, and environmental security. And she has uh, served as senior advisor to the Bureau of International Narcotics and Law Enforcement at the US Department of State. She's also been a strategic policy advisor at the Interpol. And so today, uh, with her enormous background on international security regimes, I've asked her to talk, uh, extend her uh, talk to include Taiwan and its exclusion from these and how it, the international security regime might be strengthened uh, if Taiwan uh, was given a greater role, especially with her experience on Interpol. And um, we then turn to Shannon Tiesi, who will be the discussant. And she comes to us from the media world. She is the editor in chief of The Diplomat, a very well known and well regarded and one of the fastest growing uh, news journals, Shannon. Congratulations on that. I followed it for years. Uh, her writing focuses on China's foreign relations, domestic politics, and economy. She previously worked at the US China Policy Foundation. And she gets to step back after our two panelists are done. And as a journalist, I'm assuming she's going to ask some tough questions. She's used to that. But she will also give her own commentary and insights. And um, we'll have the panelists go for about 10 to 12 minutes, followed by Shannon for about five, seven minutes. And then we will turn it over to the Q&A to you all. And let me just make one uh, more uh, uh, observation that to the audience. When you ask the question, please do it in that Q&A box. You can send questions throughout the session, but please make sure to give your name and affiliation Without that, we simply cannot ask the question. So with that, I'm going to ask uh, Vincent to kick, kick it off for us. Thank you, Deepa. Thank you, Ben and uh, Deepa for that very well uh, warm welcome. Uh, as the pandemic uh, progressed, sometimes we say we are socially distant. I think just the country, we are physically uh, distant, but we are socially connected. And thanks to modern technology, we can have a webinar like this. And also thanks uh, Deepa for that very uh, good uh, set of uh, introductory remarks to put today's um, webinar into context. Uh, this year marks the 75th anniversary of the founding of the United Nations, which of course uh, stood on the ashes of World War II to build a future for the mankind. And the topic for today, Taiwan's role in international health uh, travel and security and multilateral institutions and so on is timely uh, is ever timely. Uh, in a in a in a nutshell, uh, I think that the the UN's dreams about a true uh, truly a, a multinationalism would be incomplete without Taiwan. And my uh, assignment today is to focus on uh, public health and the travel. So I'd like to begin with a contrast between 2003 and 2020. And this distinction is uh, separated by a, a, a two strands of the virus. One is called the SARS uh, in 2003, and the other is called, the, or initially called, the scientific name is uh, SARS-CoV-2, or now, of course, called uh, COVID-19. In 2003, 
uh, during that pandemic, uh, I was actually in Kaohsiung in Taiwan. And uh, Taiwan, uh, be because of its geographic prox proximity to China, and lots of uh, exchange of people and commerce, and also due to the flaws in China's governance system, uh, namely concealment by local authorities, suppression of dissent or whistleblowing, uh, slow governance, so slow response, and insistence on the protocol with respect to uh, WHO. So a lot of people thought that Taiwan would be uh, a collateral damage because of all these, uh, its exclusion from the WHO and its proximity to China. Indeed, Taiwan uh, learned a very uh, 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 harsh lesson from that. It recorded the third highest number of cases and death after only mainland China and Hong Kong, and was the last one to be uh, removed from the list of SARS. So WHO, uh, in the end, only described Taiwan's toll as, quote unquote, unlucky. So ever after the 2003 SARS lesson, uh, Taiwan vowed never to repeat it again. It, um, uh, it, it was a casualty of China's bungling and Taiwan's exclusion from WHO. Of course, that also uh, added more moral support uh, for um, Taiwan's uh, inclusion in the global health system. However, it's not until 2009 when the KMT government uh, came into power, which was more acceptable to China. Under the name Chinese Taipei, uh, Taiwan uh, first gained observer status uh, at WHA and did so uh, from 2009 to 17. Unfortunately, uh, that invitation was withheld after the current uh, administration, DPP, came to power. So ta Taiwan, once again, does not have access to WHO. The lesson Taiwan learned from 2003 uh, enabled Taiwan to put in a lot of uh, very uh, uh, advanced measures. I won't uh, take time to uh, elab elaborate them. And Taiwan also did not take China's word at its face value. The combination of very effective surveillance measures and this skepticism about China's uh, official word uh, combined to lead to one of the most exemplary record uh, with COVID-19 uh, for Taiwan. As of yesterday, I last checked, Taiwan recorded 495 cases and six deaths for a population of 24 million. This allowed Taiwan, of course, to quote unquote, punch above its weight, uh, waste because Taiwan actually provides an open, transparent, and democratic model. This is in contrast to China's uh, uh, model. And after Taiwan uh, put its um, uh, pandemic control uh, in place, Taiwan was also able to offer humanitarian assistance to allies, partners, and friends. And the most visible symbol of that was, of course, the, the face mask. Now, today I'm going to make a case for greater uh, inclusion of Taiwan in multilateral institutions uh, on four points. First is uh, due to the universalist principle. Just take WHO, for example. The WHO constitution states its main objective is the attainment of all peoples of the highest possible level of health. As of 2016, the WHO has 194 member states. All of the members of the United Nations, except for Liechtenstein, plus the Cook Islands and the New Way. The last time I checked, Cook Islands has a population of 11,000. New Way has a population of 1,600. And I just said, Taiwan has a population of 24 million. And WHO also has two associate members Puerto Rico and the Tokelo, and also several entities enjoy observer status, such as the, um, the Holy See, the Order of Marta, and the Palestinian uh, Liberation uh, Movement, and so on. So I think it is possible to, I think it's actually imperative to include Taiwan because of this universal principle. So the second point I want to make is that the WHO, entities like WHO, 
or WTO or uh, ICAO, International Civil, Civil Aviation Organizations, all these multilateral organizations and so on, will not be complete without Taiwan because each of these multilateral institutions regulates one issue area that does not much implicate the high politics issues of sovereignty that Beijing find most neurology and also when it comes to the issues of Taiwan's international status. In other words, functional cooperation may be able to dampen the sensitivity regarding Taiwan's sovereignty. Just take WHO, WTO, uh, excuse me, World Trade Organization, for example. Uh, the, a, a truly World Trade Organization would be complete, would be incomplete if the world's 16th largest trader and powerhouse in manufacturing particularly information communication technology is not included. Take uh, ICAO, for example, International Civil Aviation Organization. This Montreal-based organization regulates the safety and standards of air travel. As you know, uh, in modern times, most of the um, novel coronavirus uh, travels through air, most efficiently through air. And Taiwan stands at a crossroad, not only, only in terms of commerce, but also pandemics. And of course, the, 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 when the pandemics hit, one of the first things every national government will do is actually to impose travel bans. So we now have a public health version of the beggar thy neighbor policy. Taipei, the Ta Taiwan uh, Taoyuan International Airport, is actually a major international uh, air, air travel hub which handle 49 million passengers uh, annually. In fact, uh, Taoyuan Airport handles even more uh, passengers than Newark, Miami, Houston, or some international destinations like London Gatwick or Tokyo Narita. So, but, so there's no reason, I mean, there's no very good reason, functional reason, Taiwan is not included in ICAO. In fact, Taiwan was uh, invited once in 2013 as a special guest uh, to, to the um, triennial uh, conference of ICAO, but for the same reason, it was later withheld uh, because of uh, the DPP came into power. I should mention that diseases know no boundaries and do not respect nomenclature or protocol. WHO cannot fully fulfill its function without Taiwan, and international organizations have been able to accommodate various entities. The third point I want to make for uh, incre increasing Taiwan's multilateral participation is actually due to the increasing cost for continuing excluding Taiwan in deference to China. It used to be that Taiwan bore all the costs. Most countries are indifferent or they don't want to offend China. But uh, given the COVID-19, many countries uh, actually find themselves also victims of China's handling of the pandemic politics. So therefore, they actually have an interest in China's internal governance. They have an interest in investigating how the virus originated and was initially handled. They are also less sympathetic to China's sensitivity. The, I would say that the, uh, the old, uh, politics also uh, incur more costs for the PRC as well, because China wants to uh, emerge as a respectful great power, but its reputation obviously suffer greatly uh, in the uh, COVID-19 case. There has been growing international support for Taiwan. Uh, however, it didn't result in Taiwan's uh, uh, rest restoration of the access to WHA this year. For example, in the United States, Congress uh, uh, had a series of pro-Taiwan legislation and President Trump signed into uh, law the Taipei Act, which actually show up, uh, seeks to show up Taiwan's international status. And the U.S.-China tussle uh, has also highlighted the attention on Taiwan. The J Japan, United, uh, European Union, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, and other democratic countries have become more vocal on their uh, support for Taiwan. There is some uh, discussion of uh, if WHO is uh, not very responsive or too pro-China, 
whether the United States and other like-minded uh, democracies may want to form uh, their own separate NATO-like public health body. However, having made all these four points for in, in support of Taiwan's inclusion, I also want to uh, offer some cautionary tales. First, compare, again, comparing 2003 and 2020, uh, the, the reality, one reality we need to face is that uh, Chinese power uh, has been growing in the last 17 years, and its in insistence on its nomenclature and worldview have also increased. There have been more Chinese nationals uh, in the international organizations. For example, uh, uh, ICAO is now, fund, uh, is now led by Liu Fang, who used to be the head of China's civil av aviation organization. Interpol, with, whose head used to be a Chinese uh, national, Meng Jianzhu, who is now sitting in Chinese jail. And WHO uh, Director General is said to be someone uh, who is a China man as well. And many more international organizations uh, have now have Chinese nationals at the helm. This is a systematic uh, uh, strategy by Beijing to uh, broaden its international influence. Another thing is that in many international organizations, there is actually a dynamic called group politics, namely that many group, many countries actually vote as a bloc rather than individually. So on many issues, China can, quote unquote, routinely command the votes of less developed countries. This happens to the United Nations Human Rights Commission, for example. Uh, this is funded by the United States, uh, Eleanor Roosevelt, but now the, uh, China uh, actually co routinely commands majority in that uh, council. So the United States uh, decided to withdraw. And as you know, in the last two years, the US-China relations in general have worsened. This arguably also reduced the U.S. red leverage over China. Finally, uh, the cross-strait dialogue, which was in um, which, uh, which was actually uh, more um, uh, smooth during the uh, KMT era, now of course uh, is uh, more problematic. Uh, of course, the KMT government uh, was able to gain inroads in WHA and. Uh, ICAO by accepting the 1992 consensus. The current government does not agree with that. Uh, in fact, that the, uh, the uh, PRC government uh, under uh, Xi Jinping has actually narrowed the room for interpretation for 1992 consensus, making it impossible for Taiwan to uh, agree to disagree. So Taiwan has to disagree. And finally, uh, as you know, uh, the handling of this current administration in the United States uh, leave much to be desired. The United States blame it uh, on the WHO and has actually officially uh, announced that it will withdraw. I think this will take effect uh, next year. So when the, when the chief uh, supporter of Taiwan in WHO has uh, withdrawn from this organization, how would that play into uh, the support for Taiwan? This is like a when, uh, the, when the, the Trump administration withdrew from the TPP, uh, there were other states such as Japan, Australia, Canada, pick up the pieces. But most analysts believe that the prospect for Taiwan to be in the TPP was also diminished as a result of U.S. action. So I think the case is strong, uh, but uh, China's clout has also increased. I think I will end there. Thank you for starting us because it's such a great way. And uh, now I would ask um, Jessica Graham to talk about a topic that we don't normally hear much mentioned in the same breath as Taiwan, international security regime. So, Jessica. In with uh, George Washington University's Seeger Center for Asian Studies. Appreciate being here alongside the panelists. Um, so yeah, Taiwan lost mo much of its presence in international organizations several decades ago in place of the PRC, including the UN and Interpol, Interpol in 84. Uh, today, Taiwan's only recognized as a member in a few international organizations, uh, many of which Dean Wong mentioned, but ASEAN, APEC, NATO, uh, to, to name a few. 
Um, you know, Taiwan has requested on several occasions, they've been quite persistent and vocal in requesting to join as a member in, in many of these international platforms. And even with, with regards to Interpol, to sit in as an observer um, and no positive responses to date. Um, uh, Interpol, as, as Dean Wong mentioned, Interpol's former president, Meng Hung Wei, who resigned in mid-2018 but first went missing, was a, a senior-level Chinese official within the Ministry of, of Public Security. And, um, and, you know, any request for Taiwan to become a member country would not have been approved despite Interpol's apolitical stance in accepting member country requests. Um, currently, Interpol President Kim Jong-yang is from Korea. Again, still a highly unlikely that Taiwan will gain membership in the near future. I will say I don't think it is impossible, though. Um, when I was there uh, in, and departed in 2018, the, uh, there were several countries that were uh, included as, as new members to their 194 member country count to date. And there was certainly dialogue and discussion of the optics of accepting some of those at the highest levels within Interpol to ensure um, you know the what what it would look like to certain countries. In particular, Palestine was was one of the more recent countries that was uh, included, and and you know how that would look to other other countries such as the U.S. Um, as as it moves forward um, with regards to several considerations. Uh, you know, the U.S. is as a major funder to many of these international organizations like Interpol. Um, so Inter the Interpol General Assembly, uh, you know, that's a that's an annual meeting where uh, chiefs of police come together from around the world. And even just as late as last year, Taiwan had requested to sit in even just as an observer. And I think there's not a, a you know, there hasn't been a massive change in that request. It's been persistent and vocal, as I have mentioned. But I think the subtle sea change and the difference in the, in the last year or so is that countries have really begun voicing uh, their support for Taiwan's request uh, to join uh, these these annual meetings in whatever capacity. And that includes the U.S., the U.K., and others who who um, who are supportive of that, uh, including uh, you know dozens of co U.S. congressmen and women had wrote a letter to urging Secretary of State Pompeo to apply pressure diplomatically. Um, so you are seeing uh, some progress and some momentum, if you will. I think while the U.S. foreign policy in East Asia was a pivot to Asia under the Obama administration and a centerpiece for the U.S. security strategy, the U.S.-China economic and trade tensions are at an all-time high with regards to uh, to the Trump, current Trump administration. And so, you know, I think this provides a real opportunity for neighboring countries and strategic allies like Taiwan to who, who is embarking on a comprehensive security policy through economic security, health security, and military interests to really uh, have an opportunity to, to, to forge uh, stronger, even stronger relations with the U.S. Um, and Taiwan. Uh, you know, the, the security priorities globally are, are really cybercrime, counterterrorism, and organized crime. And so that's, those are all three areas that Taiwan can help lend their experience to, uh, to the global security uh, platform or community. And I think the consequences of Taiwan's omission from the international security regime is, you know, it creates new blind spots for terrorists and criminals to exploit uh, in Taiwan um, if they're not being in, included in, in, in situations like Interpol's I-24-7 system and databases uh, for sharing information timely. Uh, also, you know, Taiwan's omission weakens the global counter cyber efforts. Uh, Taiwan's consistently hit by cyber attacks from uh, the PRC and is used kind of by a trial run for other engagement uh, with countries. And so, um, therefore, I think Taiwan's uniquely positioned uh, to assist the international community in protecting uh, from cyber theft. I think if we look at President Tsai Ing-wen's uh, historical election 2019, they unveiled their largest defense budget uh, of 2.3% of their GDP, and I think their 2020 figures have, have even increased further. So you do see um, uh, their engagement from a security to, to really uh, to be on a, a level playing field with, with other uh, you know, democratic uh, countries. I think also, you know, with 
COVID is in particular, I think it's taught us that we're more interconnected than we realized, despite us having faced SARS and other global pandemics in the past, um, bird flu and others in that region in particular. Uh, you know, I think we're, we're all painfully now aware as we sit in, in our homes and in our offices uh, virtually that we are vulnerable to human and health security. I think uh, Department of Human and Health Services, DHHS Secretary Alex Azar just recently visited last month Taiwan. It was the highest level visit in 40 years. So, so you're really starting to see, um, I think, a lot more action behind uh, rhetoric uh, for um, either in spite of uh, Beijing efforts or or in support of Taipei. So I think the 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 argument for inclusion in a global security regime is very clear uh and i think I, i'll leave you with you know some more uh maybe questions than answers that i've provided which is you know i think more important of a question is not necessarily whether taiwan will be able to to engage and um, be a member. I think that's inevitable eventually as we become uh, more connected. But it really is, you know, um, the more important question is, um, you know, once they are in these uh, forums, multilateral forums and institutions, um, will they really have a true voice uh, when China can and has the ability to thwart those efforts of democracy, good governance and transparency? And additionally, um, you know, we're facing a period in time where uh, major powers like the U.S. are making political decisions to pull out of many international organizations and treaties such as WHO, as Dean Wong mentioned, and the Paris Agreement, the, the Climate Change uh, Treaty Agreement um, globally. And so it certainly, you know, has turned the tide. So, you know, will states be left behind or will institutions no longer be important? And that's kind of the, the, the questions that, that I think um, are, should be grappled with uh, from, from a practitioner and academic level. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jessica. And as we saw, even though we don't think about necessarily in Washington that much, uh, about Taiwan and international security, just the new idea of cybersecurity and how it's become so much more important in Taiwan's role um, is important. And thank you for adding these new dimensions to our understanding, Jessica. Um, with that, uh, two panelists uh, with their uh, great remarks, I now want to turn to Shannon TAZ, um, who's going to give her uh, Critique or thoughts or commentary or however she wants to handle her discussant role. Over to you. Thank you, Deepa. And, um, thank you for having me on this panel. I've really enjoyed listening to the thoughtful comments and uh, recommendations from both Jessica and Vincent. This is an incredibly important issue. Um, as we've discussed, it's only become more important amid the COVID-19 pandemic as we truly see firsthand the consequences of excluding any party, um, in this case specifically Taiwan, from the international system. Uh, I think both Vincent and Jessica laid out compelling arguments for Taiwan's participation, um, both philosophically in terms of what the UN and the international system stands for, uh, but also practically uh, the impact of Taiwan's exclusion on global health, um, on air travel, on security, on all of these sort of transborder issues. Um, I also really appreciated Jessica's perspective from the policy side on some of the efforts that have been undertaken to try to get Taiwan um, included. I think we, I want to take a little bit of a step back uh, and talk about what this actually means in practice, um, because the current reality, as we've been discussing, is that Taiwan's participation in these international fora happens essentially at uh, China's behest, uh, which means Taiwan's international role depends on domestic Chinese politics and uh, domestic politics in Taiwan. As Vincent was pointing out, China has a clear preference for the KMT historically over the DPP, which is the current governing party. Uh, so in essence, that means who Taiwanese select as their leader um, and vote into their legislature helps determine whether or not China grants them international participation. And 
Obviously, there are many issues with that from a moral standpoint, from a practical standpoint, from a philosophical standpoint, but that is the current reality that we face. Uh, and so the question that I want to ask is, what can Taiwan actually do to change this um, in a practical sense? This, and obviously, this is a difficult issue because as both Vincent and Jessica mentioned, Taiwan has been trying consistently for decades to have a greater voice in these institutions um, with unfortunate limited success. So that's a question that I kind of want to frame my remarks around. Um, China has created a fairly clear benchmark that needs to be met for cross-strait relations to go back to the Ma era normal um, and presumably also Taiwan's international role. As Vincent mentioned, Taiwan was previously invited to take part as an observer in some of these international institutions, the WHO and ICAO, when the previous president was in office. Um, but that was never made permanent. Essentially, every year Beijing would decide whether or not it, it would deem Taiwan worthy of an invitation, uh, which is not sustainable for Taiwan having a, a true voice in the international system. Uh, as Vincent pointed out, uh, Xi Jinping has, in effect, redesigned, redefined the 1992 consensus to mean um, reunification uh, under one country, two systems. And Hong Kong uh, is not looking like a model Taiwan would ever want to follow at the moment. And there's a concern that that might forever close the door to any Taiwanese government, including the KMT, ever truly embracing the 1992 consensus. Um, even Hang Po Yu, who is seen as the uh, China-friendly candidate in the past uh, Taiwanese presidential election, was forced to publicly reject the one country, two systems model for Taiwan. Um, where does that leave the 1992 consensus in Taiwanese politics remains very much an open question. And uh, we still don't know what that means for the possibility of Taiwan playing an international role. Uh, you in effect have Taiwan and China moving in different directions on that point where China says, we need this for you to have any sort of relationship with the world and Taiwan saying, this is increasingly untenable for us um, as an existential question for the fate of the, the country and its people. Um, something else that we also need to wrestle with is that we have has seen a huge groundswell of support for Taiwan to have an international role. That's something both Jessica and Vincent covered um, quite capably. Um, but still, Taiwan dropped its bid to attend the World Health Assembly, um, which is likely because it knew it would not be able to win a vote uh, on the issue. And as Vincent pointed out, China has a fairly large block of countries, um, largely smaller developing countries that outnumber um, quote unquote, the Western world. And we've seen this on other issues on the Human Rights Council. So in the international system where the majority rules, how can Taiwan overcome, um, in effect, the, the China factor, even with strong support from countries like the United States, the UK, uh, France, Germany, Japan, um, and all of its backers? Um, how, do we, how do we get over this hump, in essence? Um, and it's particularly concerning. I think that Taiwan has not been able to receive permission to attend the WHA and the ICAO because those would seem to be the least politicized of the UN bodies, um, which I think is a point that both Jessica and Vincent raised. They're very technical. There's not really any political reason to object to Taiwan participating, um, as there might be even with Interpol. Uh, these security issues can be controversial in terms of how do you define terrorism? Um, how do you talk about cybersecurity? All of these are have become political issues as well. So if Taiwan is being effectively blocked from participation, even in these very technical bodies, what does that say about to have a greater international role in Interpol or um, even someday the, the United Nations itself? And, and I also want to look a little bit more about the implications of um, Taiwan's exclusion and the strategies that other countries adopt to deal with that. As Deepa mentioned at the beginning of her remarks, the multilateral system itself uh, is very much under strain, um, in part because of the policies of the current administration in the United States, but also there have just been a lot of frictions um, and difficulties in tackling 
emerging global issues and reaching consensus on those. So one strategy that uh, has been floated for increasing Taiwan's participation in the international world, um, which, which Vincent brought up as well, is to create sort of a separate um, body. Uh, Vincent called it a NATO-like grouping, but essentially a, you would have a uh, maybe the U.S., Canada, New Zealand, um, France, Germany, the European countries, Japan, Taiwan, Australia could form essentially their own public health grouping. Um, my question on that is, what does this mean for an already strained international system that you're effectively creating a shadow uh, body? And that's something that China has been severely criticized for, for creating its own institutions and mechanisms where it has more control. Uh, so what, do, what would it mean for the WHO um, and for the UN for the, the countries that are Taiwan's friends and allies to create their own separate grouping just so that they could include Taiwan. And I think we need to wrestle with what that would say about the international system. And finally, I think there's the converse point to be made, which is what does Taiwan's great success, um, particularly in the COVID-19 pandemic, while being excluded by these international bodies, say about their uh, efficiency and um, their role in the world. Uh, Taiwan has been one of the best performers among the pandemic, and it's, it's not part of the WHO. So what does that say about the role of the WHO um, in, in global public health, frankly? And that, this is a point that Jessica gestured to. I think we are going to see the international order evolve in the coming years uh, just by necessity. And the question is, will it evolve or will it be left behind um, as countries decide it's not serving their interests and it's not providing the function that it used to in the past? And um, yeah, I, I will leave it there, but it's a question for Taiwan to ponder whether it needs to join the international system at all or whether the international system as we know it um, might be on its way out. So I'll... Uh, I'll let the panelists uh, take up some questions now. Thank you all. Thank you so much, Shannon. You raised some very big questions um, and uh, very important ones. I knew you would. And so I'm going to ask um, both uh, Jessica and Vincent to uh, address whichever points they'd like to in the points that we made. Uh, if I may start with uh, Jessica uh, for some specific points that were made by uh, uh, Shannon on Interpol, for example. Um, if we could keep this maybe to just a couple of minutes so that we'll have time for the Q&A. Thank you. Sure. I mean, I think that the pendulum has swung even just in the last kind of four to eight years or so with governments in Europe and governments, uh, you know, and out in the Western governments in particular, where you're seeing a lot of these um, you know, protests and, and unrest and, uh, you know, even to, to Hong Kong, right? And, and so you've got a lot of this dialogue and, and unrest and statehood is becoming stronger um, as a response to that. And so I think naturally statehood has, is going to go in the direction of continuing to be stronger than, than the institutions, whereas we were much more and utilized institutions in the, in the last several decades um, to be the meeting point for major decisions globally and discussions. And so the pendulum has kind of swung in the opposite direction where things have closed up. We've become much more isolated in many uh, ways. And as we're seeing, you know, in situations like COVID where we're closing our borders instead of uh, having that dialogue and we're pulling out of or want or, you know, threatening to pull out of, of organizations like WHO. So including the funding. I think really the answer goes back to where is the funding going? Should a country uh, really want to continue to participate in institutions um, and having the clout uh, to do so? Vincent. Uh, yes, I, I think uh, Shannon asked uh, excellent questions. Uh, I'll just take up maybe a couple. Um, I think International participation enjoys a uh, high degree of support, uh, you know, cross-partisan uh, support in Taiwan. So I would think that whoever that is in power 
uh, will need to address uh, this popular yearning. You know, for Taiwan uh, citizens, uh, they think that for their hard-earned democracy and economic story, they deserve uh, some proper treatment. So as, as to the strategies about accessing or entering these international organizations, I think you have also seen that Taiwan over the years have become more uh, pragmatic and they are experimenting the strategies and the modalities. So starting in 1993 or 1994, uh, they have their aim was primarily the United Nations, uh, either you know restoring the Republic of China or to uh, admit Taiwan as a separate new state and so on. And in recent years, even the DPP government uh, focused on uh, UN uh, specialized agencies where uh, the, the cooperation on functional areas are more important and therefore less uh, controversial. So I think Taiwan will continue doing that. Uh, and then the I think you, you made an excellent point uh, that uh, despite the increasing groundswell of support from uh, major democratic countries, Taiwan still needs support of uh, the, you know, those developing countries that constitute the majority in most international organizations where China holds clout. Um, yes, I think that this, uh, of course, is one thing that Taiwanese government and diplomats, uh, they have some task ahead. But I will say that the major support of the support of major democracies has a demonstration effect on these developing countries. I have long, long thought that until very recently, the United States, uh, after the 1979 derecognition of ROC, has uh, uh, played a very passive role in terms of shoring up uh, Taiwan's international status. So, for example, the major law, you know, Taiwan Relations Act, Section 4, only says that nothing in this act will uh, allow Taiwan's exclusion from international organization and so on. And that was 1979. And as um, uh, Jessica mentioned, that after 1979, starting 1971, Taiwan lost all major international organization membership. So, and then in 1998, when former President uh, Bill Clinton visited China, I think he made a very unfortunate statement, the so-called three no's. The third no includes that we do not support Taiwan in international organizations that require statehood and so on. Later, the you know, State Department kind of gradually you know, uh, modified that, that we support Taiwan's voices or meaningful participation and so on. But I always think that this is too little. So I think that, that you know, if major democracies can be more vocal and more um, uh, visibly uh, support Taiwan, that will have a, a demonstration uh, effect on the developing countries. And I think that uh, the, U the United States and uh, Japan and Australia are already beginning to do that. The State Department um, likes to highlight a framework called the Global Cooperation and Training Framework, GCTF. Uh, that's a framework in which Taiwan can, uh, Taiwan's uh, positive contribution to the global community can be highlighted. None of these countries um, have diplomatic relations with Taiwan, but Taiwan's positive role, nonetheless, can be highlighted. But my point is that we need more forums and greater forums like GCTF for Taiwan to um, to, to be felt uh, globally, and in fact that. Uh, the prolonged period of uh, excluding Taiwan may actually make a so-called new normal that m most countries uh, in the world uh, have actually no experience of what it is like for Taiwan to be in this body, and what kind of contribution they can make to this body. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for elaborating on some of the questions and uh, enhancing the commentary. Um, before I turn to the Q&A, we do have several questions that have come in. Um, I just wanted, I can't resist asking one uh, question myself before I open it up and take the prerogative as moderator. Of course, many of the questions and uh, issues that have been raised is how to, how to make the change happen so that Taiwan is more included in these forums. 
What will it take for that change to happen? Now, from uh, just an academic point of view, of course, we look at norms and the way in which norms can change over time and therefore lead to uh, changes in institutions. The other way is, of course, that there's a crisis, that there's a systemic crisis that forces uh, institutions to change. So it, there are two ways in which I see uh, just uh, possibility of change, and I'm wondering whether um, you can um, uh, suggest which one of these, because we are facing a, a crisis, uh, but also the norms have come in as well, principles underlying that. How do you see these two um, operating in the case of Taiwan? And uh, this is to the two panelists again. I'll take the first crack at that. I, I think, uh, Deepa, your juxtaposition of the impetus for change, uh, normative change and crisis-driven change uh, is a very useful one. And I think the uh, in, in the case of Taiwan's uh, role in the global community, um, the, the normative change probably take a long time and uh, the persistent uh, support, growing support and, uh, and so on, will contribute to that. Uh, but then the crisis, um, you know, a lot of people say that the Chinese word for crisis is actually a double word. It actually means uh, a danger and an opportunity. So take the current the pandemic crisis, for example. It is danger. It is a danger to uh, the health and uh, safety of millions of people around the world. But it is also an opportunity to highlight whether our current pre uh, premier multilateral institutions such as WHO continue to serve the mankind well. Uh, it, it is still the, still the principal uh, vehicle uh, through which we can achieve the highest, attain the highest level of health for everyone. So I think the crisis, uh, you know, like the the, uh, the the conventional wisdom is that after World War II, that was a terrible, terrible war, but the mankind uh, have vowed to never repeat that. So we have the institutions uh, that are still standing uh, in Washington, D.C., and so on. Uh, so, uh, you know, I, I think that um, crisis make people very uncomfortable, and we have to make a lot of changes. It, when Sometimes when institutions become too uh, dr uh, driven by inertia, then a crisis might be a catalyst to break that. Yeah, I mean, I think norms versus crisis, we're looking at a long term versus a short term, right? And uh, I think one approach is proactive, the other is reactive. And I think we're currently in a crisis that's reactive. And I think you're seeing uh, in the midst of the, uh, of the financial crisis, in the midst of unemployment uh, record high in the US, and, and in the midst of the pandemic and, and the health uh, threats to people's livelihoods, you know, um, you you will find that I think we will have a reactive response. And in regards to that, I think you're seeing the from the norms, you've you've seen the persistent requests and Taiwan is is requesting the the right support at the right time by the right countries to really try to shift the levers and move them. I think, you know, also in times of crisis, there's an opportunity for innovation. So that may mean to your point of this kind of separate body or the ability to have, you know, an ad hoc special meeting alongside the WHO or however, you know, you can, it doesn't always have to be black and white membership or not, right? And so, you know, Interpol or Taiwan has asked, for example, for Interpol to even just sit into meetings as an observer, not necessarily just at request for a full membership as a country. Uh, so I think that there are many options out there that could be applied uh, for the global community to learn the lessons and the successes of COVID from Taiwan. Thank you, uh, both of you. And uh, now it's my pleasure to turn to the audience who have been waiting patiently. Thank you very much for that. We still have plenty of time, so I think we can get to all of your questions, but feel free to continue um, asking them. Um, so let me first start with uh, Tina Chung from the Voice of America. Um, so you can expect a tough one here, another journalist. Um, she asks, 
while the US is helping Taiwan with countering Chinese pressure, even with the prospect of Chinese retaliations, other countries may not be as forthcoming in helping Taiwan as the US. So China's leadership role, as you all mentioned here, uh, and many of the IOs is also making it hard for Taiwan to have a role in international affairs. And um, this is something that you've already spoken about, but perhaps you can expand on this. Is there any way to change this challenging dynamic that Taiwan is in? Or is it going to persist as long as Taiwan's DPP is in power and not accepting Beijing's political demands? So uh, this question from Tina Chang uh, is not, uh, either of you can take this or all of you actually, uh, any three of you, I'm gonna let uh, you decide who wants to take that. Perhaps you can just unmute yourself and start responding. Press the button, whoever gets presses the button first <laughs> gets to go. Uh, uh, this is almost like a game show, right? <laughs> So anyway, uh, I think uh, this question um, uh, reflects a very sometimes uh, familiar, uh, sometimes a very unfortunate pattern in uh, global politics, which is that when due to China's uh, glowing cloud and uh, insistence, when you deal with China bilaterally, it always becomes sort of a test of how much do you care. The Chinese can always insist on uh, getting um, its terms uh, or its worldview uh, prevail because you eye the Chinese market or access or whatever. But if the major uh, countries uh, led by the United States take a collective stand, then China sees that its worldview is not universally uh, accepted, or at least it's you know principally rejected by certain countries then it will give each individual country more courage to pursue their own national interests and values. Take the Czech Republic, for example. Recently, the president of their Senate uh, visited Taiwan. And this is after the Chinese uh, diplomats uh, have uh, lobbied a lot, of, lobbed a lot of threats, but the, I think that the Chinese threats have actually backfired, even though the visit of the Senate president uh, did not uh, receive the, um, the approval of their president or the foreign ministry. But I think that the, uh, the Senate president actually uh, uh, spoke on behalf of a lot of uh, uh, Czech people who now have uh, second thoughts, you know. So I think that maybe if, a, if the Czech Republic can be more forceful then I think that more uh, smaller uh, democracies uh, can also be more vocal. That when you are dealing with China, you have to deal with it on normal terms, and you have to treat Taiwan uh, more normally. Anybody else? <laughs> or... Okay, uh, let me move to the next question. This comes from uh, Kai Jin, uh, a non-resident scholar at the Seeker Center. And um, Kai would like to know about the possibility of cross-strait cooperation. So slightly different uh, angle here. And the question is, given the current tension across the uh, cross-strait, would this multilateral cooperation that Taiwan and the international community seek include Beijing's participation. Would this kind of collaboration be possible? Or maybe Beijing is just not welcome in any form of multilateral cooperation that includes Taiwan. Um, perhaps uh, we can ask uh, Shannon, who I think has written about this a bit. Sure. Um... And also, hello, Kai. He's also he's written for the diplomat before, so I'm pleased to see that you're joining us in this event. Um, I, I think I would would turn your question around a little bit. Um, you said that is is it possible China is not welcome in any international fora that includes Taiwan? Um, I think the problem is that Taiwan is currently not welcome in any international fora that includes um, 
Beijing. So I, that does seem to preclude anybody, whether it's, you know, at the official UN level or just um, a more informal grouping from including both of them, uh, not necessarily because the other parties would reject China's participation, although given the current climate, that is certainly possible. Uh, but I think there's also a real chance that China would refuse to participate, even if given the chance. Um, because it does not want to take part in a grouping where it sees that it is being given equal status um, and voice as Taiwan, because in Beijing's eyes, that legitimizes Taiwan as a separate country, which is the last thing that the, the leaders in China want to do. Um, I also think there is, again, it's it's a both an opportunity and a crisis, returning to the theme of a previous question, for Taiwan in the current um, souring of many attitudes around the world towards China. Um, and in one hand, that does increase uh, Taiwan's chances of having more international partners, because there are a lot of countries who think if they want to somehow um, get back at China, they should be standing with Taiwan. Um, and I think that's part of why we saw the Czech Republic Senate president going to Taiwan. As Vincent mentioned, it's because attitudes in uh, the Czech Republic have soured on China quite considerably in recent years. But that's also dangerous for Taiwan. Uh, you never want to be in a situation where Taiwan's international role is dependent on other countries um, being angry with China because that, again, gives China all of the power. If it mends its relations with these other countries, what does that mean for Taiwan's role? So I think it is, it's not desirable for Taiwan's international participation to always come um, at the cost of China's exclusion. Um, but as I said, you know, at the beginning of my remarks, we also have to face the reality of the world we currently live in, in addition to hoping to somehow make changes that we would like to see. So, yes, in the current uh, atmosphere, I don't think it's likely at all that China would take part in a grouping, a separate newly created grouping that includes Taiwan. Um, but I don't think that it's impossible in the future um, if China would be willing to join such a grouping, which in my mind is the biggest question. If I can just make a follow up on that uh, and ask, uh, Jess uh, ask Jessica how uh, it was that, what was the experience with Taiwan being in Interpol? I think you said until 1984. Um, how did, can you give us a sense of how that actually worked since it did include China as well? Yeah, well, no, I mean, they, so Taiwan, in deference to, uh, to the PRC, uh, Taiwan was was pulled out of, of Interpol, but they would have been treated as a member country, um, just as as today, with access to international cooperation and law enforcement to law enforcement engagement, sharing of information in a timely uh, and 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 uh, in a timely manner for actionable uh, investigations or any kind of law enforcement actions that are needed by uh, their law enforcement agencies there. So that that, um, you know, and as well as having an, a national central bureau, which would be in the capital with um, local law enforcement agencies sitting in that and having direct access to Interpol headquarters. So that that's what the flavor would have looked like and the tools and resources that would have been at their disposal. All right. Um I, we have now a question directed at Dean Wang. Um, this is coming from Jeffrey Kuo uh, from GW. He's an economics student here at uh, Jeffrey. Uh, he asked the question, Health Secretary Azar's recent visit to Taiwan is what he wants to talk about. Of course, he went there with the official purpose of learning about countering COVID. Um, but this was closely followed by the lifting of US pork imports to Taiwan. So some Asian watchers believe this was a tit for tat move. And so the question is, do you think that the US will ask Taiwan for favors in exchange for US support of Taiwan in military or multilateral realms? Very political question here. 
Yes, uh, Secretary Azar's uh, visit, recent visit to Taiwan was the highest of a cabinet rank um, official, U.S. official in, in years. Um, he, I think that visit was uh, operated under a very good uh, pretext, not that you know, any official U.S. official visit need any pretext. Um, but nonetheless, I think the symbolism is that the United States is more interested now to cooperate on Taiwan wherever possible and will not be so shy about uh, showcasing Taiwan's positive role on the, on the global community. Now, whether there is any connection between sort of this um, uh, more elevated uh, symbolic support uh, represented by Secretary Azar's visit and the, the port issue, um, I think they, 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 they both uh, probably belong to the uh, strengthening of U.S.-Taiwan relations. I've always thought that um, the U.S.-Taiwan uh, economic relations uh, leave much to be desired. So uh, the United States has more than 200 uh, trading partners. Uh, Taiwan, with a population of 24 million, is actually the 10th largest uh, trading partner of the United States. You know, sometimes a little bit larger, sometimes a little smaller than India, which is the only other country with 1 billion people. However, the trade relations between the United States and Taiwan seem to have hit a snack uh, uh, over uh, the, the issues of uh, you know, market access, but symbolized by the uh, ban on the U.S. pork, uh, adding uh, food, uh, I mean, adding additives. So I think that uh, President Tsai was trying to um, uh, break the logjam, so to speak, by declaring that the United States, by declaring that the Taiwan will allow uh, U.S. pork to enter Taiwan markets based on internationally accepted scientific standards and also based on market principles. The, you, the Taiwanese consumers still have choice to uh, uh, taste uh, domestic pork, which is excellent and delicious, or the U.S. pork, if they have any concerns. So it, nonetheless, the USTR has made it clear that there will be no forward progress uh, toward bilateral uh, investment treaty or let alone free trade agreement if this so-called market access issue uh, is not resolved. So I think he's, she's trying to break the logjam and it's very unfortunate that U.S.-Taiwan relations are so multifaceted and especially the economic partnership can be stronger, but nonetheless, it is a roadblock. <laughs> Um, I, I think, yeah, I think for any diplomatic visit, it is a, it is a combination or, or, or some sort of blend of, of diplomatic carrots and sticks. And I think, you know, the first and most important thing on uh, the current administration's mind on any visit is e the economy and strengthening that. And so, you know, I think the, the pork discussion was, was to, to Dean Wong's uh, point, uh, you know, for, for market access and, and boosting the economy. I think as far as COVID COVID in the question uh, from from Jeffrey here, you know, on, you know, uh, their the the visit there and 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 the controls, getting rid of controls uh, of China. I think with regards to uh, Taiwan, their their success was not a matter of luck uh, with COVID. I mean, they have they have been. This is a result of careful planning and digital innovation uh, that they have done. They do uh, the the highest levels of the government do annual kind of drills, if you will, uh, to really set up and be sure that they're prepared for uh, something like this, um, that we are we were all very unprepared in the U.S. Uh, to deal with at the government level um, to 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 respond quickly and, and swiftly. Thank you, um, and thanks for uh, bringing up the economics element here. Um, I just want to remind everyone that our next um, roundtable, it will be on U.S.-Taiwan economic relations, looking at it actually beyond just the U.S. and Taiwan, but the new opportunities with the um, uh, issues that have come up now with the technology migration and so forth. All right. Um, I have another question here. This is from um, 
Stephen Smith, an independent consultant. And this is a kind of a two part question. Uh, the first part is, should the Taiwan Relations Act be amended? And if so, what modifications would you recommend? And the second part is, could amending the TRA potentially impact Taiwan's ability to participate in multilaterals? So first question, should the TRA be amended? And if so, how will it impact uh, Taiwan's participation potential? And again, whichever, whoever wants to take this up, please proceed. Okay, with uh, that permission, um, I think the whether Taiwan Relations Act uh, has uh, served its purpose has been debated uh, for a long time. My analogy is that uh, Taiwan Relations Act uh, is a house with very good bones, good foundations, but it is a 40 year old house. So that does need a little bit update because otherwise you cannot sell the house, right? So, uh, so what kind of update? Well, I think uh, uh, before I talk about the update, and I think that it's also important to point out that the uh, Taiwan Relations Act, as envisioned by the original framers like uh, Lester Wolf uh, and so on, made it very clear that what matters more is not just the clause, the text of the law, but how it is implemented. So for example, uh, section two, that a lot of people argue that Taiwan Relations Act is not a defense uh, treaty, uh, but there's nothing in Taiwan uh, Relations Act that will not uh, pre uh, preclude, that will preclude the United States from defending Taiwan, although the answer has never been made clear. Or that said, you know, if providing Taiwan with articles of defense and services and so on. So I think if what matters more is whether the uh, administration is faithfully uh, implementing the TRA. Now, uh, I think this administration is a little different from the previous seven administration, namely that in the past, the conventional wisdom was that this house was good. You know, no need to, uh, to change that. In fact, some people even argue that by amending the Taiwan Relations Act, you might actually open the whole Pandora, Pandora's uh, box. I have a whole article written about that. But this administration is different. The sentiment about Taiwan and uh, China have changed. So there was a series of pro-Taiwan legislation, uh, the Taipei Act, Taiwan Travel Act, uh, Asia Reassurance Act, and so on. And uh, President Trump has signed each and sing every single one of them. And so I think that you can regard those uh, pro-Taiwan legislations as an update of this 40-year-old uh, fundamentally sound house. Um, so as I said earlier, if uh, I find the Taiwan Relations Act has, has any um, uh, drawback is that it uh, helped ensure Taiwan's security, economic prosperity, and arguably also enhance Taiwan's human rights progress. However, it did not help Taiwan gain international status. So that might be the area where it needs an update. All right. Uh, if there's no other uh, comments uh, on this, actually, I'm going to let uh, a, um, another uh, point that Jeffrey raised. Uh, our GW students are very inquisitive, as you can see. Um, Jeffrey points out that the Taiwanese citizens at the moment cannot work at uh, uh, institutions like IMF and the World Bank. They're a UN affiliated uh, organizations. And uh, the question is, can that, do you see that particular uh, 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 restriction changing anytime soon? Is that something? It's a very specific question. Anybody know the answer to that? Um, yeah, I mean, I can I can speak a, a bit from my own experience. I think, um, you know, there are certain international organizations that that uh, they they have specific HR requirements and, and they want to fulfill uh, 
specific, you know, balances and, and whatnot, whether it's gender or whatnot. But I think that with regards to the UN international organizations, there, there, there may be ways, again, it's not so black and white. If you're a member, you can work here or not. I think that some organizations do allow for the capacity or capability to serve as contractors or things like that, where um, it's a direct kind of it kind of it's a loophole to get uh, hiring but i but i think as far as the formality of being a member to an international organization for the purpose of being able to work within these international organizations um you know it would it would uh i think it would probably be a, a more long medium to long term effort all right thank you um and by the way, just to those who are remaining uh, in the audience, do feel free to keep asking questions. We have a few more minutes. Um, but I wanted to just to follow up again as we wait for some more questions to come. Um, on going back to the question of some kind of um, halfway house kind of participation, if you will, uh, for Taiwan, and taking some examples and and um, as we know, until I think um, a few years ago, Taiwan was participating as an observer at the WHA, World Health Assembly. Um, could someone give a, a, a little recap of that and how that worked in practice, actually, just to have a sense of um, if Taiwan were to participate in an international order, what would it look like? Whoever would like to jump in. <laughs> yeah, I can jump in a little bit. Um, I mentioned this, I touched on this a bit in, um, in my remarks. What Taiwan's participation has looked like in the past is essentially um, every year it receives an invitation or it doesn't. <laughs> and that is largely dependent on um, Beijing deciding if it wants Taiwan to participate in that in that organization that particular year or not. Uh, and as I mentioned, and as Vincent mentioned, as Jessica's mentioned, uh, Beijing's decision is largely based on what it views as uh, good behavior from the Taiwanese government. So the Taiwanese government's cross strait policy and international policies uh, being seen as not crossing Beijing's red line um, past which it starts to accuse Taiwanese politicians of being pro-independence. So what we've seen in the past is essentially that Taiwan has been left waiting to see if it's going to be allowed to join in these um, in these meetings. And even then, it's only participated as an observer. Um, it's not been given a voice or a full vote in these international bodies. Uh, so even the past level of participation left a lot to be desired. and. Um, now we, we don't even have that is the, the current problem that Taiwan is facing. Vincent, I have a question uh, related to this, and that is that the in May, when the uh, chair of the WHA changed, it became India. India is currently the chair, and we know that India-China relations have gone from bad to worse uh, and not doing well at all. And there are different points of pressure that the Indian government is looking at. And one of them is to become much more friendly and openly friendly toward Taiwan. Do you see India's position as the chair of the WHA um, executive board having any impact at all? Yeah, I think um, one uh, aspect that has not received the proper attention is actually the increasing warmer relationship between India and Taiwan. Uh, you can imagine why this is the case, you know, that there are shared democratic values and that uh, a lot of uh, Taiwanese investors, businessmen that used to play a great role in China's economic rise now want to find other greener pastures, you know, due to the shift in the supply chain and so on. Um, I think uh, I, I need to uh, study more about the role of the uh, WHA chair uh, in setting the agenda and so on. I think their term is for one year, right? So the last time in May, when eventually um, 
Taiwan decided not to uh, pursue uh, the WHA uh, last minute invitation in this year, uh, it was um, due to the pandemic. I think the, the world uh, body also decided uh, they want to devote more time in this coming December to this, to include uh, the, the case of Taiwan in the agenda. So I think the chair of the WHA certainly has that uh, uh, ability to include this item on the agenda. In the past, it was um, maybe uh, the, the chair can even be more creative in terms of the debate format, because in the past, it was always two for Taiwan and two against Taiwan. And after they debate for another 20 minutes, they say there's no consensus. Therefore, we will not consider Taiwan's case this session. So basically, there's a continuation of the status quo. We hope that uh, those uh, uh, leaders will be more creative and to, in, to uh, give the, the members of the body a real chance to consider the merit of Taiwan's observer status. Thank you. Thank you. We have uh, time for one more question. So the last question I'm going to take is from, this comes from Chris McRae of The Economist Asia. And Chris believes that the Trump administration plays every Asian state against each other. And he wants to know if the U.S.-Taiwan relationship is dependent on the U.S. coming elections. Um, and is it possible for the U.S. to re-engage with the United Nations uh, post-November and how that might change the relationship between, we're talking about the strains in the U.S. Uh, U.N. relations and its impact that it might have. But, and I know this is very speculative even at this point, but uh, I'll be happy if any of you want to take this qu uh, question. So I'm a journalist, Shannon, you are. are <laughs> this is something we're paying very close attention to uh, in terms of the policy positions that are being laid out, um, particularly by the Biden campaign, because I think we already have a fairly clear idea of what the Trump administration um, would do in terms of China and Taiwan. Um, there has always been very strong bipartisan consensus on continuing the relationship with Taiwan, but we're currently seeing an adjustment um, in the U.S. relationship with China, um, a very, very large one, uh, you know, driving some people to say we've entered a new Cold War between the United States and China. And that has um, a reciprocal impact on the U.S. relationship with Taiwan, uh, of course. Traditionally, there's been a reticence to take certain actions um, with regards to Taiwan in U.S. policymaking circles because of the fear of consequences for the U.S.-China relationship. And we've already seen that the Trump administration has been willing to test those boundaries, um, sending a cabinet-level official, um, Alex Azar, to Taiwan, um, selling F-16s to Taiwan, which had long been thought of as an crossable red line uh, in U.S. defense sales. Um, and, you know, there's there's talk of going even further, um, you know, possibly hosting Taiwanese cabinet level officials for a visit to the U.S. and other things. Um, the question is whether the Biden administration is going to continue pushing those boundaries or if we would see something more like a return to the traditional U.S. approach to Taiwan, uh, which, as Vincent outlined, uh, it's it's a very strong foundation, but it's also not really challenging the status quo, um, particularly on Taiwan's international status. And I think partially that's going to depend on how the Biden administration also views and approaches China. Um, and we're still not quite sure. We're in the middle of campaign season, uh, so it's always difficult to gauge how campaign rhetoric is going to translate into policy. And certainly we've seen some very harsh rhetoric about China from the Biden administration. Um, but there's also a strong commitment to return to multilateralism and U.S. global leadership, um, which necessitates cooperation with China in many ways. So I think we're going to have to see as we would with any administration, how these potentially conflicting parts of the, 
the campaign platform fit together in practice? What emphasis do you place on multilateralism versus cooperation or competition with China? Um, and then where does Taiwan fit in in the overall list of U.S. foreign policy priorities? Anyone else have a 30 second uh, intervention here? Yeah, I'll just say, state that I think that the if we are looking uh, to Shina's point at at what the Biden uh, potential Biden administration would look like, I think that it would be a very uh, similar extension to what the Obama administration had with regards to their pivot to Asia, where China was the main focus um, to the detriment of the Middle East and other regions. So I think that the region will definitely be a priority potentially, right? But um, whether or not it would be uh, to the demise of Beijing. I certainly don't think that any other administration historically has ever challenged to the degree that this current administration has, uh, has challenged China. Um, but I think that the arms sales are something that happens annually. Um, and, um, and so whether or not there will be continued kind of challenging of the status quo of Beijing and in support of Taipei uh, will, be, uh, will be interesting to see um, however the next election uh, turns out to be. All right, well, I think you get the last word, uh, Jessica, then. Uh, we are just uh, reaching the end of our time here. Um, let me just say that uh, this has been an extremely stimulating panel, and thank you for the questions as well. I think we've learned quite a lot from this interaction. And as I, I'm looking outside and it's, there's a torrential rain here, and I can see something like that in the background of uh, Vincent as well. I'm not sure. But one good thing about all this is that we can all leave without having to get wet, since we just have to go from our living room to our dining room or whatever. Um, let me, uh, I want to just say that uh, a recording of this webinar will be available next week. And uh, Ben mentioned that we're having three more events coming up and we will be putting the details of that up on the Seeker Center's Eventbrite page soon. Um, just to um, wrap it up, you know, I think we tend to think about in international politics, power and money. Today, we've been talking about institutions and it seems to me that one of the other ingredients that we really need is imagination. Because in the case of a Difficult case like the question of Taiwan's role in international organizations. I'm always struck by the way in which we can always come up with uh, with solutions or half solutions using some creative imagination. So let's see how the uh, next week uh, proceeds at the UN General Assembly. And uh, with that, I'm going to say. Thank you all very much, most of all to my panelists who are terrific and as well as to all the audiences. And hope to see you again uh, somewhere soon, hopefully in person. With that, bye-bye. <laughs>